At no point during the night was she more than half a mile from the police station, but the park was thinly lit and the road snaked through the forest in both directions. I took a personal interest in her story after I learned how badly her body had been mutilated. The details continued to flood in, and I'm still working to tease apart the evidence. What is undeniably clear is that a killer still roams free. He's out there somewhere, and he's stalking new victims in the neighborhoods that I call home. For this reason, I can for now only insinuate many of the things that I know. To reveal certain details would be to paint a target on my back, and so they cannot be shared here. That's what's said. Here are the facts as I understand them about the night that smiling Jane Doe died. They named her that because her lips had been peeled away with a blade. It was her bared teeth glistening like white porcelain in the dawn's light that first drew the attention of the jogger who discovered her body. The park where she died is famous one, and smiling Jane Doe was not the first woman to be murdered there. I fear putting too fun a point on the location of this place, so let me just say that this park is located inside the National's capital. You have likely heard the park's name before. Locals will be glad to tell you about the unlit roads wind deceptively through the wilderness here, and how those same roads become especially treacherous at night. They might also mention how the bridges arc high above the low roads beneath them. These are the sort of bridges that make push and fall murders appear neatly like suicides. Smiling Jane Doe was from out of town. She was likely in the city that weekend just to take in the sights. No abandoned car was ever found that could be tied to hers. If at some point she had been carrying a purse or wallet with ID inside, then it seems that the killer took the clue to her identity with him. We can't yet guess how or why she had traveled in the district, or where it was that Jane called home before she died. It's possible that she was hitchhiking and found herself here entirely by chance. For instance, Jane could have been visiting this place deliberately. Maybe she traveled here with a happier purpose in mind for herself, and she simply remained outside a little too late after dark. Here are the events of the night that are plainly and accurately as described them. Smiling Jane Joe tried to flag down a car that was traveling through the park approximately 10.40 p.m. The car's driver was a female in her late 30s, and this was crucial witness, unfortunately, continued down the road without stopping her vehicle. The driver would state later that she barely saw Smiling Jane Doe there in the darkness and did not notice her until the victim was close enough to narrowly avoid being hit by the car. In the particular park, and especially at that time of night, can be dodged too harshly for refusing to stop for strangers. After all, carjacking sometimes begin with the false premise of a woman in need of help. Our witness driving past with a, was a mother of three young children. I hold no ill will against her for making her choice. As the car disappeared around the bend in the road, smiling Jane Doe fled into a thickly wooded forest of the park. She was trying to lose her tacker and then dribbled trails of blood across the road indicating that her pursuer had already made some progress in causing her harm. If she had pressed a little further into the woods, she might have been caught in the light of a consulate building on the far side of the park. There were security personnel there and they were surely keeping watch all night. That could have saved her easily, and she could have made it far enough to be seen. Unfortunately, at some point, Jane Doe double-checked back the way she came. I believe she did so in an attempt to lose her pursuer. The night would turn to be a lindley of heartbreaking moments in this way. Jane Doe came so close to salvation more than a dozen times, but a split-second decision was rarely in the wisest ones. This is especially true when someone is in mortal terror. Smiling Jane Doe squandered her chances to survive, and each time she did not realize what she had done. Any one of us might have suffered precisely the same streak of bad luck, and especially on a night like that. She found more wandering roads as she pressed through the trees, but she could not guess where she was now stood in the re relation of the rest of the twisting side roads in the park. Jane followed the path of one of the park's elevated bridges, as I mentioned before, these bridges loom fatally tall over the ground beneath them. They're all the kind of structures that make murders look like accidents or suicides. It was at this point that Jane spotted an ambulance speeding over the bridge from the opposite direction. She attempted to make the vehicle stop, but the ambulance was already responding to a critical situation on the northwest side of the city. It continued on without her, and would soon arrive at the scene of another gruesome homicide. I believe, in fact, that Smiling Jane Doe's killer had two victims that night, but the details of his earlier murder are a story for another time. For now, I intend to honor Jane Doe by somberly describing the facts of her death alone. 
She was alone on the bridge once more as the ambulance sped away. I believe that smiling Jane Doe then saw her killer approaching from the shadows. She likely considered jumping from the bridge, hoping perhaps to end an awful pursuit once and for all by plunging to her death. This assumption is supported by the blood and bloody footprints that were found on the bridge's upper railing. Trace evidence suggests that she decided at the last moment again sleeping. She continued on that footfalls that indica- indicated a sprint. She was fleeing down the road. At this point, it bears mention that Smiling Jane Doe was indeed barefoot and that she was bleeding from her feet due to the loss of her shoes. I believe that an unknown killer confisted Jane's footwear simply to torment her. Evidence indicated that she did a great many things that night which were intruded to prolonging the chase of the human quarry. I believe that our killer caught up to Jane Doe s- several times before she reached the roadblock. He would injure Jane in a new way each time, or else do something that restricted her movement on foot. This is why he took her shoes. He let smiling Jane Doe continue attempting to flee at least four separate times. It sickens me to this day to consider it. The DNA evidence collected from Jane Doe's body indicates that she met two distinct alliance before her death. It was my theory after fleeing from the bridge, Jane Doe found a pedestrian walking along the dark road in the opposite direction. I suspect, I suspect that he was moving up the road and towards the bridge when she found him. Jane Doe must have begged him for help, and I can only imagine the horror that she felt to learn that the pedestrian was in fact an accomplice of the killing. F- from the psychological profile, I feel c- confined for the second man toyed with the smiling Jane Doe before revealing that he understood exactly what kind of peril she was in. I believe that he restrained Jane Doe and allowed the killer to catch up to her once again at his leisure. It was at this point that our killer most likely carved out her eyes. Police reports indicate that exhausted roads flare were found on the side of each road from where the mutilated smiling of Jane Doe likely began. This would imply that the killer and his accomplice bit a fake roadblock, possibly an impossible in imitation of a city authorized detour that was preventing traffic from flowing naturally through the park. In doing so, they ensured that no witnesses would enter the road where they would likely torment Jane in her last moments. The spirals and aimlessness trails of blood at this location implied that our killers allowed Jane to continue trying to flee from them. They let her keep attempting to save her own life for most for most of another hour. Now binding Jane could not navigate the dense under forest and trees. If by some chance she managed to wander too far up or down the long roadway, it would be a simple matter for either the killer or its accomplice to shove her back towards the center of this sick arena. On the night that I learned the most of these details, I remember praying that there was nothing more to be discovered. I asked God for my research to prove that she simply bled to death there. It would mean at least that Jane experienced no more fear and that she felt nothing when the cut away from her skin from her face. The coroner's report would grant me no such mercy. However, smiling Jane Doe was given drugs to keep her awake. Her mind likely understood that bore witness to those last moments of her life even more vividly than the killer himself came to claim to remember them. No family ever came forward to claim smiling Jane Doe. How could anyone have guessed that their daughter had ended up this way? If you were told, could you even accept it? I went to see her in the city morgue before she was incinerated. Ever since then, I would work daily with investigators to bring her killer to justice. What was done to her can, cannot go unanswered. The details I have excluded have been there to include deliberately. This has been done to protect the dignity of the dead. There is more yet besides the remains unknown, even to me. Let it be known, I have absolutely no plan to take my own life. I do not intend to die in a certain part that will not be named, but can certainly be guessed. If I am found dead in a particular park, then that means that the killer has learned something about me before I was able to learn something about him. I don't intend for that to happen, though. I will do my best to outwit him. There are far too many unhappy ghosts in that strange patch of the wilderness already, and I do not wish to join them. By the grace of God, may my work help Smiling Jane Doe find peace.